In September 2022, discussions around the Lithuanianization of foreign names intensified when Prince Charles became King Charles. In Lithuania, the new monarch went from Princess Charles to Karalius Karalis? We know that king in Lithuanian is Karalius, but why did his name change from Charles to Karalis? That was the first of a few interesting encounters for me. As I was thinking about this recently, I came across a movie poster at a bus stop for the movie John Wick, which in Lithuania was marketed as Jonas Vikas. I found this interesting because it's widely known that Jonas is the Lithuanian equivalent to John in English. And then, at the same time, it's widely accepted that the late Pope John Paul II was Opiejus Jonas Paulius Antrasis. And finally, I also remember checking out some classical music concerts in my first few months of living here, and seeing names in the programs like Wagneris, Elgaris, and Beethovenes. These are full or partial Lithuanianizations of the names Wagner, Elgar, and Beethoven. It's all of these examples and the discussion around Lithuanianizing popular names that forms the inspiration for today's video. The challenges and quirks of importing foreign names into Lithuanian culture. So if you're ready, let's get started. And we'll start by looking at the first example in the introduction. King Charles, or should I say, Karalius Karalis. According to LRT, who spoke to an expert from Vilnius University, the Lithuanianization of names is determined both by the different phonetics of the languages and by literary traditions. And in the case of King Charles III, the first two British kings with the same name were Karolis I and Karolis II in Lithuania. Even though in English, they were also Charles. Thus, changing Charles to Karolis fit the established pattern in Lithuania. The academic that was interviewed highlights that there were, quote, no F, H, and CH sounds in the Lithuanian language until a hundred years ago. And this would also explain why Pope Francis had to be translated to Franciscus rather than Franciscus, as it was also a matter of an established tradition with other historical figures such as St. Francis. The associate professor from Vilnius University was also quoted as saying, when we deal with language issues, we always face a dilemma, tradition or system. Systemic things cannot be touched and there is nothing to worry about. Yes, Carolus III is a matter of tradition. Traditions are such a thing. If it starts to get in the way of living, it needs to be changed. How does Carolus III prevent us from living? No way. And that's why if we have Carolus I and Carolus II written in the textbooks, it is logical that we continue. So there's the reasoning behind the Charles's Catalyst discussion. It was a tradition that was deemed should be continued. So what about the case of the fictional John Wick? To help me answer this, I asked the Lithuania Explain YouTube community, and here are some of the top responses I received. Domantas says, Traditionally, all the names were translated into Lithuanian. John to Jonas, Columbo to Kodubas, etc. They even used to translate some surnames, like Mr. Burns from The Simpsons into the Gela. The Gela means torch in Lithuanian. Excellent. Nowadays, Domanta says they just add an AS ending to make it grammatically correct, while still preserving the original names as much as possible. Another contributor by the name of Totvidas writes that this is mainly done because John is a fictional character in a foreign world slash story with respect to a daily Lithuanian consumer. Having it as Jonas would sound hilariously wrong and funny because it would be hard to imagine the local and statistical Lithuanian Jonas doing all that crazy stuff. A few people mentioned something similar, that directly translating John to Jonas loses some of the coolness of the name John and his rebellious and dangerous character. Yeah, not really. Finally, another contributor says that only foreign names of saints, monarchs, and popes are Lithuanianized, which I assume means to be translated. They say that the names of common people are left with approximately original pronunciation, although that's not always the case, this person adds. For example, all names in Harry Potter books and films are Lithuanianized. And this comment mentioning Harry Potter is a great transition to discussing the quirks and challenges of translating literary names that have some meaning and purpose embedded in their usage. And my wife, a massive Harry Potter fan, 
was happy to give me some of the examples in the books where names were translated or not translated. So she's going to help me with reading out all the Lithuanian names for the rest of this video. Hello. So first off, Harry Potter is simply adapted to fit Lithuanian grammar. And so it's Harry Potter's. Some, however, have joked that his name should translate to the Lithuanian word for a potter, like someone who makes pots. So like Harris Pojus. Albus Dumbledore is Albus Dumbledore's. So this is simply just adding Lithuanian endings to fit grammar. It's the same for Professor McGonagall, who is Professor McGonagall. Hermione Granger, however, is Hermiona Ikirene. This is a strange one, since we don't really associate the name Granger to anything in particular in the English language. However, Ikirele means someone who is obnoxious or bothersome. You're saying it wrong. It's Leviosa, not Leviosa. Draco Malfoy was translated to Dracus Smirjus. This surname was assigned because it means bad smell in Lithuanian. Now, I think this is an interesting choice because the original Malfoy in French translates to bad faith. Draco's friends, Crab and Goyle, translate to Nyorsga Irgilis, respectively. Nyorsga in Lithuanian is someone who grumbles while Gilis could be translated to the sting of an insect. Notably, Ron Weasley wasn't translated in the same way as these other examples. In the Lithuanian book, it's Ron Spislis. It's widely understood that the Weasley family name was given by the author because of her love of weasels. So if this name were to be translated in Lithuanian, then it might be Ronis Žebinkštis. This Fox video here highlights the challenges of translating Harry Potter names due to all of the meanings embedded in them. The name Hogwarts combines two English words, but because the name stayed the same in most languages, those connotations were lost for those readers. In an attempt to preserve Rowling's approach to the school's name, the French translator used Poula. Poudula means lice of bacon or fat. The Hungarian version went with Roxford, a mix of the British University Oxford and Roquefort, a well-known blue cheese. And so clearly, Lithuanian publishers had the same challenges as other translators around the world. A bit of a side note here, but I noticed at another bus stop advert that Mario has no adaptation at all. Mario is just Mario. My wife says that this Nintendo video game character is a bit different. He's less of a name and, well, more of a game. So interesting. My wife doesn't just like Harry Potter though. She's a big bookworm and loves reading all sorts of things. And so in discussing this topic, she looked through her book collection to see how publishers have adapted English authors to Lithuanian. She found that for anything pre-early 1990s, the author's name on the cover was often transcribed to fit Lithuanian grammar. As you can see from these examples, Margaret Mitchell is spelled Margaret Mitchell. Axel Munth is Axelis Munten. And J.D. Salinger, or Jerome David Salinger, is presented as Jerome Salingeris. However, the early 90s is when we start to see a change where book covers no longer bother to adapt names to the Lithuanian language. Instead, they just left the name in its original form, as you can see with these examples. Axel Munth, Albert Camus, and Robert Kiyosaki. All of these names would be very different if adapted to fit Lithuanian grammar. My wife believes that it's the result of a shift in culture and being a little less stringent about adapting all four names to the Lithuanian language. In the times of Soviet occupation, there may have been this feeling that the language was being threatened by the foreign occupation. But that feeling is less prevalent today, and so people are more okay to keep the spellings of foreign names. While we are nowhere near how things were during Soviet times, I think some people still do feel like the English language is eroding Lithuanian in its own way. As a slight tangent, I think that's why the Lithuanian Language Commission, or VLKK, exists. It's a way to actively preserve the Lithuanian language from forces that would erode its prevalence, even if changes happen innocently, and not more actively through a foreign occupation. 
I think this is why the current Italian government proposed a new law in early April to ban English from official government communications, attaching a big penalty for violations. As reported by Euronews, the Italian member of parliament who introduced the bill calls the phenomenon agglomania and says, We continue our battle for the use of our language instead of English. We can't understand why we call dispenser the automatic hand sanitizer dispenser. So instead of using the word dispenser in English, the government would have officials use the much more wordy Italian expression dispensatore di liquido igienizzante per le mani. Euronews highlights that the Italian language, like other languages in Europe, has adopted many English terms in recent years, in part because these were terms indicating new things which did not belong to the Italian tradition, such as computer or social media, etc. Part of this was because the English language often offers a more concise version of terms that in Italian would take a roundabout way to express. I made a video about the Lithuanian Language Commission, or VLKK, and its role in preserving Lithuanian. One of the more controversial stories associated with the VLKK was when it objected to the usage of the English word airport on the bus that took people to and from the airport. But taking its own stand, the Vilnius municipality went ahead with it anyways. Some Lithuanians like to poke fun at the VLKK, and someone even set up this parody Facebook account, pretending to be the language commission. The Facebook page is dedicated to posting fake official rulings on how to properly name things in Lithuanian. Clearly it's a hit, since it currently has 26,000 followers. So obviously the account had something to say during the King Charles naming controversy in September 2022. Here's what they posted. It's official. There is no argument in it. Names must be written in Lithuanian. Karolis Pintis. Charles Dickens. Thomas Lauke. Is Tom Waits. Jelena Joplina. Is Janice Joplin. Someone commented with a few other examples of how English names should be translated into Lithuanian. So James Brown would be... Jakubas Rodasis. Tina Turner would be... Tina Pusukaite. Rod Stewart is... Rykšte Truškin Melnas. Muddy Waters would be... Purvinis Vandinis. And then Johnny Cash would be... Jonukas Grinasis. If you don't know Lithuanian, this might not be too funny for you. But the humor is there for Lithuanian speakers. But I really hope no one's offended with me repeating these posts. I know that their intent is to ridicule the important work of the VLKK, but I can't help but be amused by these examples and what it would actually sound like if names were directly translated between languages. Like, for example, if the Lithuanian name Dalia Griposkaite were translated into English, it would translate to Fate Mushroom. Okay, but all jokes aside, what can we conclude about importing four names into the Lithuanian language? Above all, it appears that at the very least, a foreign name must be adapted to fit Lithuanian grammar when being used in a sentence. Well, maybe except for the case of Mario. But if the letters are pronounced differently in English, then they may be swapped for Lithuanian letters in order to retain the same sound. Both of these rules explain why John Wick becomes Jonas Vickas. Names are rarely actually translated, and so John Wick wouldn't be Jonas Dactis. Dactis being the Lithuanian word for a wick. And it also wouldn't be Jonas Tamponas, as Google Translate might suggest. The Charles de Carolus and Francis de Franciscus examples stem from historical traditions and are thus exceptions to what is common practice today. But as we listed earlier, where you might find names being translated will be fictional books like Harry Potter, where a character's name is filled with meaning that is important to the story and their identity. So I hope you found this video to be fun and interesting. I could probably dive even further into the importing of foreign names, particularly as it relates to actual everyday people and legal documents. But that will have to be another video for another day. And for the Lithuanian word of the day, let's go with Prisutaikite, which is a verb meaning to adapt or to adjust or to conform. As always, thank you so much for watching and thanks to my wife for reading out the Lithuanian names. Don't forget to check out my website, lithuaniaexplained.com and I'll see you next time. Bye.